Hi everyone, Supreme Patriarch Andrew Tate has been arrested and there has been much rejoicing. However, a lot of people were really upset about him being arrested, primarily, almost exclusively, men, and specifically young men. Now I'm curious as to why. Why would anyone look up to the human personification of Dr. Evil? For those of you who don't know, Andrew Tate is a alleged sex trafficker and general awful man. He has made a living out of selling his own lifestyle, but in a weird, very expensive way. For a significant fee, you too can learn how to make a lot of money and be the top G, much like Andrew Tate. And how to do this typically involves sex trafficking. By doing this, you can live the high life of masculinity, just like him, by having a bunch of cars and dressing in expensive clothes and constantly demeaning other men. <laughs> to me, that doesn't really seem like a very healthy expression of masculinity. So, why are so many men drawn to him? Of course, I need to say, hashtag not all men, but there are a significant amount of men who do like him. In addition to this, men are also typically involved in more the Secret Service released a study this week on the growing terrorism threat of the so-called incel movement. After the shootings through the streets were done, police would still discover more. Incels resent women for not showing romantic interest in them. One reason for why this might be happening is that masculinity is in crisis, with a lot of young men not really knowing what they're going to do with their lives. The role of masculinity and men in society, it is said, has lost its meaning. And to be fair, there is something to be said over the fact that masculinity is in crisis. Mass shooters are overwhelmingly men. Men are typically much more likely to murder people, but to be fair, they are also more likely to be murdered by other men. And men tend to vote more conservative and right-wing than women do. But why? After all, people aren't biologically conservative. So what's the deal here? Now, I figured that as your resident transsexual, I might have some sort of inkling into what's going on. Because as many of you commenters say, I am after all really a man. So I would have some input on this specific situation. But to be fair, if I am a man, I'm a very bad one, which you're also very kindly pointing out in the comments. Although to be fair, I transitioned when I was pretty young, so I haven't really spent a lot of time as a man. At most, I've been a little boy. But I have seen an example of what I would call masculine hopelessness. And while the solution for me was to abandon masculinity altogether, that is probably a solution that probably won't work for a lot of people. Processing used to be masculine. <clears throat> we need an answer to what it means to be a man and what it means to be masculine in our modern day society. Because if we don't find a solution to that, I fear that we're gonna end up somewhere quite, quite evil. Shall we shag now or shall we shag later? I don't know what the fuck's going on with my channel anymore. It's because Andrew Tate is Dr. Evil. Do you, do you get it? it? The joke worked on the script. Also, this necklace looked a lot bigger on the website. Um, and I don't, I, I just think it's very I ironic. Um, I don't mind, I mean, it's accurate if anything else. Discussions around masculinity typically boil down to two unfairly viewed basic viewpoints. And both of them are typically wrong, but they are sort of what is discussed in the mainstream. And one of them is pro-men, and one of them is anti-men. The anti-man argument basically boils down to arguing that the patriarchy exists, men have privilege, and men typically can sometimes exhibit behaviors that are toxic and that generally lead to the detriment of both themselves and other genders. Patriarchy. This is then interpreted to masculinity is toxic, all men are masculine, ipso ergo, all men are toxic. The pro-man argument basically boils down to saying that men are inherently masculine creatures and trying to suppress or change that masculinity is only going to lead to the detriment of both men and other genders. Traditional expressions of masculinity are healthy and are in fact necessary for 
a man's well-being. And crucially, that the current crisis of masculinity is in due part of people trying to change traditional masculine values. I've been observing this phenomenon of transgenderism for a while. My feeling is that it's most of the times men willing to transgender into women and not vice versa. Why do you think it's the case? That's a really fascinating question. I've wondered about that myself. One potential factor is that our culture so aggressively attacks masculinity, it certainly doesn't value masculinity. So you've got boys from a young age that are told your masculinity is toxic. It's something that has to be suppressed. So I think that maybe plays a part that um, boys and men are more willing to give up on masculinity completely as they see it as this toxic, poisonous thing that they're freeing themselves of. Maybe, maybe that's part of it. Alex warned us they were turning the frogs gay and he turned out to be right. We are the frog. Uh. We are the frogs. Now these two viewpoints aren't actually that much in conflict as it might seem. It's just that we live in a culture war where you have to either take a side or take a counter side on any argument. But they're actually in agreement. They're in agreement because they both focus on the idea of self-determination. Men should be, according to both of these theories, able to choose their own life direction. And values like independence and leadership are things that are traditionally seen as masculine values. So both of them are actually promoting a very traditional value of independence and self-determination and going your own way. The problem is, though, that they have different viewpoints in what that actually means. The feminist argument argues that men shouldn't be constrained by the values that are imposed on them by society. Ideas that claim that men should be Adonis-like figures of masculinity, and they should always go to the gym and be thin, but be strong, and be kind, but take charge, things like that. And so this argument says that you don't have to worry about that in order to be a man. You can be a man and be a valid man and be a strong man by embodying different values. And that's okay. Allowing themselves to try makeup, wearing dresses and things like that, while still being able to be men. Although in my case, doing those things led to hormones, so I don't know about you. And this viewpoint also typically views the modern day crisis of masculinity as being a result of the ideals of masculinity just being too high. A lot of men can't be independent or take a leadership role or be traditionally Adonis-like. But this will then be interpreted by the pro-man argument that claims that men aren't allowed to be traditionally masculine anymore that recent changes in feminism and equal rights have led men to not have a traditional role that they're used to having. Men aren't allowed to be strong. Men aren't allowed to feel anger because those things are now labeled toxic. And men suddenly have to suppress innate parts of their bodies and psyche in order to fit into what the woke mainstream wants to have. They argue that men need to be masculine and that going your own way means being able to reach that masculine ideal. That men should have self-determination, but that you need that self-determination to reach that masculine ideal. An ideal that should be preserved and that is in fact healthy for men to have. In order to maintain these two polarizing viewpoints, you also have to have the idea that there are only two gender expressions, feminine and masculine and that it is these two ideals that men and women should embody. Men should act like men, and women should act like women. And when those things mix, obviously things are gonna go into crisis. And this is the reason why, when people point out that, that some masculine behaviors are toxic, people will interpret that as part of masculinity in general being toxic. And if masculinity in general is at least in part toxic, that means that all men are toxic even though that's not necessarily what that means. There's a myriad of masculine behaviors that are perfectly fine to do and have, but if a man screams and uses aggressive force in order to get what he wants, I would say that that's pretty fucking toxic. 
which means that the people who choose to exhibit those traits and portray them as the end-all be-all of masculinity are also pretty toxic. People like Andrew Tate. But people have talked about this multiple times before, and it will still not really penetrate mainstream masculinity. And we do need to penetrate it very deeply. And the reason it doesn't penetrate isn't because men are stupid and don't get it. Men can be pretty smart, and they aren't cavemen, driven by natural urges alone. But I think it's because it doesn't offer a genuine solution to anything. Because while toxic masculinity exists, and it's been charted out between masculine relationships, it doesn't fix it. We're pointing at the problem without fixing the problem. And men want the solution to the problem. And if you just spend your time pointing out a problem instead of actually trying to fix it, that shit gets annoying. And then obviously you're going to start zoning it out, which makes perfect sense. If people pointed out the problem that I had, but never actually helped me fix the problem, then obviously that would be annoying. And some people will say, well, gender studies is on the problem. But men in general, as a social category, making up half the world's population, aren't all going to be able to go and read gender studies. But I have a weird job that requires me to do edgy book reports and come back here with it, so I can do that. But before we dig into any of that kind of stuff, we first need to define what masculinity even is. Masculinity is defined as the set of behaviors or cultural circumstances that are typically associated with positive male traits. Which is a bit of a circular argument, but it basically boils down to what we as a society have decided are good things for men to do. Things like individualism, leadership, courage, being able to play sports. Sports actually only became a masculine interest a few hundred years ago, and was for a long time just seen as an upper class activity. Which means that in a few hundred years, it'll be a masculine trait to own a lot of fancy cars. Oh, hold on, wait a Going back further into history, a lot of traits that are associated with being an upper class leader are also connected to modern day ideas of masculinity. In the Middle Ages, knightly chivalry and heroism were positive male traits, just as how being a gentleman has been popular in the last few decades. But most of these things are typically seen in the upper class. In the modern day, it's very much focused around being able to provide for yourself, being independent, being a critical thinker, getting on that grind set. Now, some people will say that it's not that deep. Masculinity doesn't have to do with gender ideas or constructs or social ideas, but it has to do with biology, cold, hard, physical meat stuff. And then people will typically point out that men have to do male things because they just have so much testosterone. Testosterone is, after all, the male hormone. And if you take a bunch of testosterone, you will act more like a man. Which is not true. A lot of studies have shown that increasing your testosterone doesn't necessarily make you live up to more masculine ideals. And if anything, it's just gonna cause you more hair loss and other hormonal issues, because it is, first and foremost, a bodily hormone. And also for the fact that the concept of masculinity has changed over time. Even things that you would think are pretty universal, like physical fitness, haven't been universal throughout history. Men's bodies haven't changed that much in the last 100,000 years, but our cultural perceptions about masculinity has. And it's because of these cultural perceptions that masculinity has changed. But if you don't like me having a humanities segment talking about gender studies and gender culture, you don't really have to look much far into actual endocrinological science to find out that increased testosterone doesn't actually do that much. When scientists have injected testosterone into rhesus monkeys, it hasn't made them more aggressive or shown other typically masculine traits emerge. But what has happened is an indirect relation to status-seeking behavior. And in some societies, being aggressive and being physically threatening is a way for you to get higher status, and testosterone might have a link with that. But in other social situations, or even just other friend groups, increased levels of testosterone might just make you more generous, if generosity is a trait that is valued as being high status. It doesn't necessarily give you higher status, 
it makes you want higher status more. But that kind of behavior does kind of influence some behaviors, which if true means that there have to be some behaviors that are at least in part universal throughout history and culture. And some of those things have been independence, leadership, bravery, and of course, sexual conquests. Oh, you look so sexy. You're so pretty. But what is actually biologically determined or not is a lot more harder to suss out than you might think. Studying masculinity in adult context is actually quite easy. You just have to like look at how men behave with other men and in larger society. You can ask men how they feel about certain things. But what is biologically linked or socially linked is much, much more difficult. One way to get around this is to study young children because children are, you know, less socially impacted by virtue of having recently been born. They have spent less time in society and haven't learned as many behaviors. And the theory is that because of this, they are more biologically driven than adults are. But this also becomes quite difficult. Take for example the idea that girls develop faster than boys when it comes to linguistic skills. This is a observed phenomenon, but another absurd phenomenon is that parents will typically read to their children and talk to them more than they will with young boys. Boys, conversely, develop slightly faster than girls when it comes to physical arenas, but that might be because parents tend to push boys to pursue physical activities and play games that involve more physical action. And this interacts with masculinity after we reach the schoolyard, because boys will typically play games where there is a winner and a loser, where there's a clear way to count points, and where the game is, you know, competitive. Girls, on the other hand, would prefer to play games that are more cooperative, games that don't have a winner or a loser, but where everyone can take part and have a good time. Now, is that biologically driven? Maybe. Maybe because of parenting styles? Maybe. The issue is complicated because kids are really good at imitating what they see. That's basically how they learn to do anything. And that means that even if you raise your child in a completely gender neutral way, when they reach the schoolyard, they're gonna emulate the other kids that they interact with. And they will, subconsciously, assimilate to any social environment. That's just how kids are. And so because of this, we don't really know the role that biology plays in traditionally masculine behaviors. Are men biologically driven to do the grind? Maybe, but probably not. But what does this status-seeking behavior mean when it comes to testosterone studies? What does it mean that boys play competitive sports with winners? Well, in the book Masculinities by author Rowan Connell, she discusses the ideas of gender hierarchies. In this book, she talks about the concept of hegemonic masculinity, which is defined as the ideal masculine type. But this ideal varies between geographic locations and across time, but it's typically defined as ideas of heterosexuality, physical strength, suppressing any emotion that is an anger, and domination of others. These things are typically seen as peak male ideals. In this book, she presents the idea that there are multiple ways to display masculinity and that they all form a hierarchy. On the top of that hierarchy, you have the physical Adonis of white heterosexual breadwinner males, top Gs, alpha males. And then all other types of masculinities are made to stand underneath that type of masculinity. And that means that any masculinity that has any associations with feminine ideas, homosexuality, weakness, compassion, they are made subservient to that. But that creates a system where you can rise in the hierarchy and raise your own status by demeaning other men. Because then you can make someone else fit underneath you. And this is how you end up with men who police the behaviors of other men. Take, for example, the idea of going to a coffee shop. 
Instinctively, some people will see some drinks as more masculine and some drinks as more feminine. Drinks don't have a gender. There is absolutely nothing biological in terms of what kind of drink you might like. But a lot of people will still say that the pumpkin spice lattes are for girls and that men should drink a black coffee in the morning, including Andrew Tate. He has the idea that you need to drink black coffee because? How you drinking that shit on the street? Right here in front of everyone. What is that? Some soy caramel double sugar dog. I like coffee, yeah, the same way I like it like I am, like brown, hot, and strong. What are this fucking old Starbucks? <laughs> bro? What he's doing here is he's demonstrating that he embodies the masculine ideal more than men who don't drink their coffee black. And it's a very, very small form of hegemonic domination. But it's something that people learn. And it also works as a way for men who do not fit that masculine ideal to feel like a real man by demeaning other men. Connell gives some examples of what she calls subordinated masculinities. And the prime example here is the idea of homosexual men. Men who are gay are typically seen as being less masculine than other men for some reason. A big reason is because a large part of masculinity has been historically defined by men's relationship to women. Men who are openly and aggressively heterosexual will oftentimes be seen as more masculine, and the ability to get women is seen as almost a defining trait in many communities, especially the insult community, where men's relationship with women is so broken down that they consider themselves deserving of women's bodies. And this belief doesn't come out of nowhere, since this was, and still is, codified in laws in many areas of the world, and has been the law around the world for centuries. It's natural that this gender order has become ingrained in the history of gender generally, but also in the idea of what masculinity specifically is, as its natural position has always been that of superior and dominant to women. So I think my sister is my her husband's property, yes. When a bride is walking down the aisle to marry the groom, the father walks next to her and gives her away, true or false. If something is masculine, it is almost always by definition not feminine, and vice versa. There is boy stuff, and there is girl stuff. And, because I don't want to seem like I'm trying to just hang on men, the exact same phenomenon exists within women and femininity as well. Connell calls this emphasized femininity, which is the equivalent to the hegemonic masculinity, and that there are other types of femininity that are subservient to that. Think, for example, supermodels with big tits and big asses and who are subservient, submissive to men. That is the ideal type of femininity in a lot of mainstream cultural ideas about gender. And just like in masculinities, one way to advance within the feminine hierarchy is to demean other women. I'm not like other girls. But women aren't having a crisis in the same way that men are. And this theory doesn't necessarily explain why. But again, this demonstrates the problem, but doesn't fix it. So what do we do then? One thing I think might help here is to question the premise of the problem. Is masculinity even in crisis at all? Well, I think that the answer is yes. I think the more correct answer would be masculinity has always been in crisis. To the point where now crisis is baked into the very idea of what it means to be a man. Let's think about a masculine crisis that has occurred just within the last 100 years. In the 1940s and 50s, the masculine ideal was very much coupled together with the idea of being the sole provider of the family, being the breadwinner. But due to the rising demands of capitalism and also the idea that women should have agency and their own financial control and resources has led more women to take a larger part of the workforce. And this has led men to no longer be that male, sole, breadwinner, provider archetype. And during this time, masculinity had to reinvent itself. This led to a crisis of identity among many men, whose sole identity was coupled into being this provider of the family. 
If you can't be that, what does it mean to be a man? Or rather, are you less of a man because you're not the breadwinner anymore? I would argue, obviously not. But I think that this struggle is still ongoing within masculinity. This is why I think a lot of people on masculine TikTok and Andrew Tate specifically, talk a lot about the idea of men having that responsibility, that men should take that responsible role in society, which on one hand takes care of their community and their families, but also leaves them in control of all the financial resources. But I don't like talking about men as somehow being controlled by their biological urges or being influenced by Andrew Tate simply because he exists in a masculine hierarchy. Men, after all, have agency and are individuals who can make choices for themselves. So in order to talk about this problem in a more constructive way, I think it's best if we look away from individual men and instead look towards men as a social group. I think we need to talk about this in sociological terms instead. Hi everyone! Welcome to the corner where I discuss academia. I feel like every time I'm in this corner, I always end up talking about conspiracy theories, but not today. When talking about hierarchical masculinity, I'm not talking about the most commonly understood version of that, which is alpha males and beta males. Although that mindset might actually be more useful to us than you might think. Now, you've almost definitely already heard the story of the guy who studied wolves and wrote a book about it and then said that they had alpha males who dominated everything by being the most aggressive, like most competitive males in the pack. And some people have taken this to apply to humans. And now that same researcher has been forced to try to do information about how his own theory didn't work out that well because he only studied wolves in captivity and wolves in captivity behave very different from wolves in the wild. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that the concept of an alpha male is discredited. After all, wolves are but one animal, and there are some animals that do have a very hierarchical structure. Humans are not really one of them, but elephant seals are. Terms that biologists prefer to use, though, is the dominant hierarchy. And this is where you can end up with males who do control the entire pack, and then you have beta males, and you have soft boys. The commonly understood idea of an alpha male, or being top G, or whatever the fuck Android Tate likes to call it, is that the person who is at the top is the person who is one, the most dominant, and two, is the person who will fight the most in order to achieve that dominance. And crucially, that life is best as being an alpha. That you will live your best existence by being the most dominant male. Now, before I dig further into this, let's be clear. It doesn't exist in humans. Humans don't exhibit this type of behavior. It is scientifically nonsense to even talk about it. Take for example the idea that everyone wants to be the alpha, that that is something that everyone should strive for, which is very much the philosophy of people like Andrew Tate. Men should be a certain way. But in elephant seal society, that's not really how it works. There is an alpha, sure, and there are some betas that want to take that role, but a lot of people aren't fighting to become the alpha. Many are quite content just being betas. In fact, there is power in being a beta. <laughs> betas rise up. If all the betas would fight to become an alpha all the time, that would lead to constant struggle amongst the males in the population. And if all the males keep fighting all the time for dominance, the pack is going to die. So a lot of people choose to not fight at all. Enjoy the easy life. Not as many rewards, sure, but less stressful, because it is stressful. The dominant alpha male typically has to fight a lot more in order to maintain their position, which means that they're going to be in a much higher stress level compared to the other animals. However, if a hierarchy is established, there is significantly less violence. But this is just in elephant seals, and human society is infinitely more complicated by virtue of the fact that we have a civilization to deal with. We have cultural norms that elephant seals 
thankfully don't have to deal with. This alone means that the hierarchical structure of elephant seals doesn't really map onto humans very well at all, which is why the theory is entirely bunk. But also what it means to be a dominant male will obviously be very, very different depending on who you ask. But for people in the manosphere circles, it has to be pretty simple in order to justify the existence of this structure. If there are more ways to exist in society, that has to mean that there are more ways to exist as a man. But if there only is one way to be a man, then there are only a few ways for you to become more manly. Media portrayals of men also make this problem worse, where a lot of men will be stoic, unemotional, but very physically jacked, and in the end of the movie, getting the girl. These men are often seen as heroic and as the ideal, and when young men see these men in media, they are going to associate those traits with positive masculinity. Or rather, the only type of masculinity that you can be. But while I've mentioned Andrew Tate a lot in this video, I actually want to take a step away from him and individual men specifically, because this issue is one of those that are just it's too difficult to talk about in individual people terms. Men make up half of the population of the earth, and y'all are a group. And in our commonly understood worldview, we're either talking about individual men who are making choices and therefore need to be held accountable to those choices, or they are individual men who are driven by urges, either biological or cultural. And I think that that is a mistake. Instead, I would like to talk about men in a sociological context, specifically paths of least resistance. Men, and all of us, really exist in a gendered system, and some will argue that we should focus on changing the system rather than any individual men. And the system in this case is patriarchy, but the patriarchy isn't just a buzzword or a secret cabal of men out there planning to destroy women. That's a very individualistic worldview, but rather it is the interconnecting social rules between human relationships. That is what's called a social system, and while it's easy to talk about social systems in the terms of entire civilizations, almost any social setting is its own social system. This includes your family, your workplace, your bar, your school, and while systems are made up of people, the system itself is what is created by all those people consciously and unconsciously acting socially with each other. I took a break for five minutes and the lighting changed because the sun went down. Piece of shit. But talking about system is difficult, especially if you want to put responsibility on individual men. Talking about a system making things worse for everyone is vague and it doesn't feel like it's gonna offer a solution to any individual man. But all systems are made out of people participating in those systems. And the same thing is true for masculinity. But how do you even know if you're participating in a system like that? Or how do you break out of that system in order to become a better person? That shit is difficult, even for people who are deep in the gendered business. American sociologist Alan G. Johnson discusses this phenomenon in his book, The Gender Knot, and he likes to compare the patriarchal system to a game of Monopoly. When I participate in the Monopoly system, greedy behavior is presented to me as a path of least resistance, what you're supposed to do if you want to feel that you belong. And when I play the game, I feel obliged to go by its rules and pursue the values it promotes. I look upon the game as having some kind of authority over the people who play it, which becomes apparent when I consider how rare it is for people to suggest changing the rules. I'm sorry, honey, I say as I take my kid's last dollar, but that's just the way the game is played. If we were the game, then we'd feel free to play by any rules we liked. But we tend not to see games, or systems, in that way. We tend to see them as external to us, and therefore not ours to shape however we please. And Johnson argues that you can predict people's behavior purely based on the rule set and completely disregarding any individual choice. In order to win Monopoly, you need to be greedy, exploitative, you need to backstab your friends, and you need to rough up all the money as much as you can. Because that is the way that the rules are built up. You can try to play the game in a different way while still following the rules, but that probably means that you're going to lose. 
the game's rules rewards a certain type of play. If we had an individualistic view of the players who play Monopoly, we would say that they do greedy things because they are greedy people. But obviously that's not true. And if we instead use the viewpoint of the rule set, we can see that they would do that no matter what. Any individual's intentions or inner feelings about the feelings of greed don't really matter. But we don't blame any of the individual players for behaving like greedy assholes because they're just following the rules of the game. Similarly, we can talk about male behaviors within patriarchy in the same way. The rules reward this type of behavior. So, obviously that is what some people are going to try to do. And while you're not forced to follow the rules in modern day society, you are still coerced to do that. You can be faced with social isolation and ostracization, and those things are incredibly uncomfortable. And this connects to an idea of paths of least resistance, which Johnson argues are foundational in maintaining and reinforcing ideas about patriarchy. These paths of least resistance are a way for people to follow the rules without feeling uncomfortable taking part in society. You can break the rules in Monopoly, but your friends and family being angry at you for breaking the rules I mean, it kind of sucks. It changes the vibe. Similarly in society, odds are you will want to get along fine with the people you talk to. And most of the time, that's perfectly fine to do. Take for example the idea of you and your friend sitting down and telling some jokes. And your friend tells a joke, and you don't, you don't really get it. Like, the punchline didn't really work, and you kind of didn't really hear what he said, like in the middle. Um, but the joke's over now, and he's laughing, and now you're laughing a little bit. But you don't know what the joke was. You didn't get the joke. So you could stop the entire conversation and sit down and ask the person to explain the joke so that you will understand the joke. But that's not fun. That's gonna ruin the vibe. And you're laughing, you're having a good time, so you're just gonna choose to laugh along instead. It is uncomfortable for you to break that social dynamic. So you are just going to go along with something even though you yourself are not really sure why you would do it. You're laughing at something that you don't think is funny. This is a fine and good thing to do. But take the idea of someone making a sexist joke. Not too sexist, not to the point where you would go like, ah, oh, okay, come on now. But just a little bit. Do you still laugh along? And the reason why I'm talking about paths of least resistance here is because I think that masculinity today has offered a few roots. Because during the rise of feminism and women taking up a larger part of society, there's been an expectation that men should be more critical of their own behavior. But that shit's uncomfortable. Taking the time to fully introspect about your gender identity, your place in the world, the way that you interact with other people as basing it on gender, like that shit's complicated. Now, I've done that because I'm a healthy trans person. And a lot of people have done that because they are very much aware of the existence of gender. But men, by virtue of not necessarily being oppressed because of their gender, are typically not forced to reckon with that identity in the same way. So, men are not incentivized to do this or forced to have this introspection. This is actually something that I think the trans people are incapable of understanding completely by virtue of the fact that we have all had this introspective moment to reckon with our gender identity in a way that maybe a lot of people haven't. So it is actually quite difficult for me to imagine how it is for someone else to not do the path of least resistance. This is also the reason why I think that like a lot of trans people end up being super gay polyamorous slutbags, simply because if you've broken the social rules once, it's a lot easier to do that again and in other areas of your life. But modern day masculinity is also based on a few outdated ideas, such as wanting to be the breadwinner of the family and wanting to be superior to women. And if you can't have those things, you're going to be uncomfortable by what you might have to be. And if you can't base your masculinity around those things, and you shouldn't, you're gonna have a hard time finding something to replace that with that is uniquely male. Now, I definitely think that it's possible, but I just think it takes a lot of work. So take all of this information and picture yourself being a young man at the cusp of adulthood. 
trying to figure out what your role in society should be like. On one option, you can try to reckon with your own gender identity, try to figure out where you're going to fit into the world and how you're going to relate to other people via the lens of you being a man. And I think that everyone should do that. I think everyone should explore their own gender identity like a little bit. But shit is difficult. Shit takes time and it's uncomfortable to do. But the comfortable option is to say that I don't have to do any of those things. Society has wronged me and instead I deserve to have that outdated view for myself. Society has changed, but that doesn't necessarily mean that masculinity has to change. And this is what I think leads some people to seek out ultra conservative forms of masculinity. Masculinities like the ones of Andrew Tate and of far right wing politics. If you believe that masculinity should be more traditional, it's a lot more comfortable for a lot of young men to simply drift into that kind of lifestyle because it doesn't require that level of self-reflection. They have a pretty clear answer on what it means to be a man. The problem is, it doesn't fit with what the modern world needs from men. And so you end up with two versions of masculinity. One that is more compatible with the rest of the world and other forms of gender expressions, and one that isn't. This is also a reason why I think that men like Andrew Tate are not just masculine, but they're hyper-masculine. They're more masculine than most of the masculine ideals of the 40s and 50s, because that is a counter-reaction to our modern-day views around gender. They are not just trying to put themselves on top of the hierarchy, they're trying to make the hierarchy more secure. But also, this isn't the real method to achieve high status. It's only a perceived method. The men who follow Andrew Tate and try to live in his footsteps are very much definitionally not top G's alpha male ultra chads. They're literally beta males because they're placing Andrew at number one. Why did I say Andrew like that? Andrew. And if you spend a lot of your time talking about how cool and masculine and successful another man is, you're literally someone who is a beta. <laughs> you're literally subservient to another man. You're not displaying traits of independence or leadership or self-determination because you're simply trying to repeat what someone else has done. Which is why I think it's completely understandable why someone would want to follow Andrew Tate. They see it as a method to raise their own status, but why also it's a completely hopeless endeavor. And most men, the vast majority of men, realize this, right? They realize that following Andrew Tate is not something good to do. And most men also realize that trying to be ultra misogynistic and ultra sexist is not something that's going to raise your status either. But that leaves the question, what is a man supposed to be? Because Andrew Tate has an answer and the woke left kind of have an answer, but that demands an incredible amount of self-reflection. And that's not really an answer either. I honestly think that the only real solution here is for men to try to create a new ideal for themselves, a new type of masculinity that takes the best of what masculinity has to offer, but that actually fits in better with more of their actual wants and desires and the rest of society. And that's not necessarily something that anyone else can do for men. This is, at the end of the day, an issue with men, between men, that masculinity has to deal with. Or if the rest of society encouraged true self-determination and encouraged men to actually break the rules of their social conventions a bit more. I would want to challenge men to dare to be more uncomfortable does the pumpkin soy spice latte actually make you uncomfortable because it's girly? Why is that? Because if there's one pattern of behavior that I've seen over and over again with the people who follow Andrew Tate, is that I see a group of men who are desperately afraid of making themselves uncomfortable. But thinking critically about why you feel the way that you do, or being around people that you might not be comfortable being around, that's something that you can explore. Why do you feel those feelings? I've heard some men argue that it's a display of weakness to show emotion or to think internally about their own gender identity. But I can't see how daring to think thoughts can be a sign of weakness. 
if anything, criticizing your own behaviors and your even personality, I think is something that is a sign of great strength. And that doesn't mean for you to stop being men. We're simply asking to focus on the aspects of masculinity that are more positive for everyone. Independence, real independence, real self-determination, real leadership, real initiative taking. Those things include making yourself uncomfortable, making yourself uneasy, questioning previously held beliefs, learning to do things that you might not see as traditionally masculine, learn to sew, learn to cook. People like Andrew Tate and other people who advocate for a more traditional old masculinity would say that this is simply becoming more woman-like or giving more power to women. And sure, that's definitely true, but it's also giving way more power to men to control their own lives. And I think that that is the thing that men need to be able to do. Yeah, baby. Hi, everyone. If you want to shag now or shag later, um, this would be a really good spot for... Plot, actually. But they're not sponsoring this video because Nebula is! You know about Nebula. It's the cool place where you can watch fun creators make fun content, like the upcoming Unrated by the wonderful Maggie Mayfish, or stuff about D-Day, if that's more up your alley. And you can find all of this stuff and more on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform that me and a bunch of friends have gone together to have a place to have videos that's not, that's not YouTube, because YouTube kind of sucks sometimes. Um, but Nebula doesn't. For a subscription fee, you can access all of my videos ad-free, uh, as well as the videos of a bunch of other cre creators uh, who make a lot of good content, uh, some of whom actually make exclusive content just for Nebula. Um, I've made an, a few episodes of a few shows uh, on Nebula that only exist on Nebula. Um, I got to ask Anita Shakiz in a bunch of questions one time, that was great. And it's also a great place where we can experiment and just generally do things that we can't really do on YouTube. And if you sign up for Nebula using the link below, you can get Nebula for a little over $2.50 a month. If you like me and you like my content, I definitely think you should check out Nebula. Hi, thanks for watching that video. I'm sorry it got delayed like seven times. I have um, depression and I had like a massive depression slump for like a week and a half, which tends to slow down video production. I also want to thank H Bomber Guy, who very kindly like did a bunch of voices and I only ended up using what, like one of them. Um, thank, thank you for that. That's, I initially had planned to have like a bunch of men do a bunch of different voice clips, um, but that sort of collapsed and I ended up just using, like, <laughs> using your voice, which I appreciate, uh, and you know, it works, so I'm happy with that. However, if you like this video and you would like to contribute to my depression snacks, uh, please follow me on Patreon, because that is my, my main source of income, uh, and it's, it's good. You get access to streams and things like that, and uh, I, think, I think being my patron is pretty fun. And if you want to see more of these videos, please subscribe, uh, hit the like button, um, leave a kind comment. I've been getting a lot of like shitty comments lately. Um, I made a few videos about conspiracy theories, which in retrospect was maybe a mistake because now I get a lot of people who believe in those conspiracy theories showing up and, you know, being generally transphobic and also just really stupid. But before we end the video, I of course want to thank everyone for supporting me to make this, this these videos and I want to give a special thanks to my patrons who make it like economically viable to do this and I want to give a special thanks to 12 Tone, Aini Salmanen, Aislin, Alicia Crawford, Amanda B, Amara, Amelia Unchained, Amy Lee, Andy Sophia Fontaine, Angelo Garcia, Ashley K, Astro Disaster, Athiet, Balaz Vins Zidul, I apologize for butchering your name, Catherine Stenson, Choices Make Me Anxious, Kerbosphere, CRT Hayes, Dana Ferguson, Dara, D. Mirandi Arisetto, Eleanor Cassidy, Amelia Clark, Emily Pinkies, Eric Owens, Erin Rafferty, Fox E, Fox Cant, Gwenda Euphoria, Hope L, Jack McKenzie, Jane Ludsby, Janelle Torgerson, Jareth Arnold, Jay the Human, Jill Isabella Gary, Jurgen, Joshua Anlick, Julia Helene, Justin Lowry, Kira Wins IRL, LPQ Silver, Leonard Chavars, Madison, Marcus Smith, 
Mari Nekar, Maurizio, Michaela, Mo Khalifa, Mod Zero, Nicholas Kapoor, Nicole Daniel, Nyofbun, Paul D. Mackey, Pavel Dubek, Remy, Rob Howlett, Rose Brunton, Shelby Von Trapp, Zitzries, Sonic Bread, Stephanie Sterling, Talia Parkinson, Taylor Sophia, Thea Vega, Thoris of Mir, Travis Siobhan, Tyr, Valerie Blackbird, Violet Tosukas Harrison, Vivian Eva Crobot, Weirdy Beardy, and Wolfgang, the Grand High Exalted Wizard. Thank you. Take a short, short break.